Okay, well, let's just, let's just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Proverbs tells us that by wisdom you founded the earth, and by understanding you established the heavens. And by your knowledge the depths were broken up and the clouds dropped down their dew. Yet we live in a society that wants to deny your existence. So it's not surprising that we as your children don't always feel at home here in this world that we live in. When we look at your creation and we see the evidence of your intellect and power everywhere, we're amazed at the blindness exhibited by those that deny you. And today, Lord, I ask that you give us your wisdom, understanding, and knowledge so that we can be a good representative of who you are to the world around us. Help us to be patient and kind and at the same time speak the truth to this world that so often wants to deny the truth. And Lord, we do need your wisdom and we need uh, your guidance as we navigate in this world of ours. And we just ask for your help. Lord, I do pray again for, for the... Pines Baptist Church, I know it's going to be a long time before they completely overcome the, just the sorrow that's associated with the accident that they had, so we continue to pray for them and for the family that lost that young boy and for just, uh, just everybody involved there. I'm also going to continue to pay, pray for Pastor Duffy and for his recovery. We pray for our our military people and our law enforcement people and ask again that you protect them as they protect us. We pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, draw their hearts to yourself and we just ask that, again that we could be a testimony to you in the world we live in. And Lord, this morning, as always, I ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this uh, last week we talked some on the gifts, and every time I go through the the gifts in Romans, or I always end up with people asking questions about them. So we're going to go into them in a little more detail today. And so our our key verse is a little different, or the verse I want to read this morning is not from Romans. It's from 1 Corinthians 12, 20 through 22. It says, But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor, again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. So that's the area we're going to be looking into. But uh, we actually are in Romans. Paul is dict uh, was dictated the book to, to Timothy around, or, uh, around 57 AD. It wasn't from Timothy, but he dictated it from Corinth. And the key verse that we've been looking at in the last few weeks is Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And, of course, the theme to Romans is redemption. And like I said last week, it's the redemption spoken of in Romans is more than just saving us from hell. It's also redemption from a meaningless existence. And through the redemption mentioned in the book of Romans, we become sons of the living God. And we're placed in a position where God, we can serve God. And the last, past couple of weeks, we've been looking at spiritual gifts. And it's important that we understand them because of what Paul says in Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, reasonable service is referring to spiritual acts of worship motivated by reason or logic. And in uh, earlier chapters in Romans, Paul presents 
the unconditional love that God has for us, his children. And therefore, it's only reasonable or logical that we should serve God when, it comes to, when, we, when we come to an understanding of his love for us. And in Romans, <coughs> excuse me, Romans 12, 4 through 6, it says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. So we saw that God made each of us different so that the strength of one person can, can cover for the weakness of another. And these gifts that God has given each individual believer are never for the purpose of bringing glory to that individual. But all the gifts are given to bring glory to God. And even though it is good to know your gift, there's something that supersedes that in importance, and that is your personal walk with God. If the relationship is not there first, a person may serve, but there's always going to be a certain amount of contention that accompanies their service. So the first responsibility a believer has to himself and to the church that he belongs to is to develop his or her personal relationship with their Savior. And that is done through studying Scripture, prayer, and fellowship with other believers. And leaving any one of those things out hinders spiritual maturity. Now, Paul said that we're to think soberly or think seriously about serving. And that's why we're taking this time this morning to examine more closely the significance of the gifts. We saw last week that uh, the subject of gifts comes up several places throughout the epistles. And that's another reason why we, they should be taken seriously. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, and verse 11, it says there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministry, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So the gifts are not something that we should seek for personal glorification. They are given to us by God at his discretion. And he gives us these gifts to be a blessing to the local body of believers. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Last week we looked briefly at Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And it says, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So here we have listed five spiritual gifts. But before we go any further, let me say something more about gifts in general. It appears that the Holy Spirit gave some gifts during the times of the early church to validate the existence, or its existence, the church's existence, in the eyes of both the Jews and the Gentiles. And of these gifts, I've identified three that seem to have faded as the church has matured. And uh, these are the gifts of healing, miracles, and discerning of spirits. But, and although God still heals and still does miracles today, I do not believe that these gifts are bestowed on individual believers. But let's, let's back, uh, get back to these verses in in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. It says, and he gave some to be apostles. Apostles are missionaries. Now there are those who think that the position of the apostle ended with the 12 apostles, and although there will always be the big 12, you might say, there were those that, uh, and these were, were those who followed Jesus during his earthly ministry, there were others in the New Testament besides the 12 who were also referred to as apostles. After the death of Judas, at the end of the first chapter of Acts, the 11 remaining apostles set about to add another to their number. And they chose from their midst two men who had been followers of Jesus since he had been baptized by John. And uh, 
Their names were Justus and Matthias. And in Acts 1, 24 through 26, and it said, Then they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry, an apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So Matthias was included with those that we call the twelve apostles. And we could call them apostles with a capital A. Um, but the definition of the word apostle is one who is sent out. And we find many fitting that uh, definition who were called apostles. And two of those who were called apostles were Paul and Barnabas. If we looked at Acts in Acts 14, in verse 14, it says when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this. So, so an apostle is a person that is sent out, or in modern day terminology, an apostle is a missionary. But let's look again at Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. It says, and he gave some to be apostles and some prophets. Now, when we see the word prophet, we think of, of an Old Testament prophet that foretold the future. But Paul gives us a different definition of a prophet in 1 Corinthians 14.3. Says, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Now this is the definition of a New Testament prophet. The word edify means to build people up. And so a prophet is a person in the church who God has given the ministry of building up others in the faith. And the focus of uh, the person with the gift of prophecy is to see other believers become mature in Christ. Now, prophets are constantly encouraging other people, especially believers. And since they genuinely have other people's, or other, the, the best interest at heart of other people, they're usually well received when something difficult has to be said. And often it's the, the, uh, the prophet who will say the difficult thing. Now this is not an easy gift because the person who has it is often grieved by the spiritual weakness of others. You'll find with every gift there's a downside. I'm not gonna go into the downside because it would take, it'd take as long as it is to teach on the gifts, but every gift has its downside. Well, look at that, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 again. It says, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. Now, the evangelist is a person who seems to always know what to say to bring someone to a point of conversion. Years ago, Janet and I were at a missionary conference in Marysville, Washington, and the New Tribes Mission representative there was a man named Rudy Johnson. And I'd known Rudy for years. He was from Hanging Dog Creek, South Carolina. And he said he lived so far back in the sticks that he had to ride toward town to go hunting. But uh, during that conference, he asked me if I would, uh, would go have breakfast with him. And while we were eating, Rudy told of an incident that had happened the day before. And a waitress came by and Rudy ordered a pancake. But he said uh, he only wanted it cooked on one side. <laughs> well, the waitress looked at him like he was crazy. <clears throat> and he said, no, that's what I wanted. I want a pancake, but I only want it cooked on one side. So the waitress went and she got the pancake and she brought it back to him. She came up to the table. She put the pancake down and Rudy looked at her and he said, you know, miss this, this pancake is a really good picture of your life. And she said, yes it is. And she broke down in tears. And she sat down there and Rudy led her to Christ. And I wish I could remember everything he said about the pancake that made it similar to her life. But the man was an evangelist. And God used him time and time again over the years to lead people to himself. And as I mentioned last week, Paul here is talking about those gifts of the ministry that are given to the church. Well, notice that he says next, and he says to some and some pastors and teachers. Now these two gifts are, are linked together. 
And I investigated a little and came across something interesting in Schaefer's book on the Holy Spirit. He says that uh, pastor and teacher is probably a ref reference to two gifts being exercised by one person who both shepherds the flock and instructs the people of God. So um, even though these two words are indicating two different gifts, they are brought together to describe the role of the teaching pastor or teaching elder in a church. Now looking at these two gifts separately, the word pastor can also be translated as presbyter, elder, bishop, or overseer. Same Greek word for all of those. And in scripture, none of these terms are ever used in a singular form when dealing with church leadership. So even though there may be only one pastor teacher, there is to always be plurality in the leadership of a church. And that's, that's, you know, that's uh, the way it's set up. That's the way the New Testament indicates for leadership in the church. There's are always other elders or overseers along with the pastor teacher shepherding the flock of the local church. That's, uh, and this is this, in this church, it's the deacons. They serve in that capacity. Now, last week, we looked at the word teacher, and we saw that it is a gift given by the Spirit of God to enable a person to communicate biblical truth. Now, apostle, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are all given for the same purpose. They're given for the perfect or the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ that's the goal the goal isn't that the apostles prophets evangelists and pastors and teachers do the work of the ministry they're actually there to train the saints to do the work of the ministry in Romans 12 6 through 8 it says and having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us let us use them if prophecy, let us prophecy in proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, many of these gifts we've already looked at, and so um, let's touch on those that we've not. Paul mentions here the gift of giving. It says, he who gives with liberality. Now, Keep in mind that with these gifts comes the ability to go beyond what is normal. We may not have the gift of evangelism, but we, uh, we should still be sharing our faith with those that we know that are without Christ. We may not have the gift of prophecy, but we should still be encouraging others in their walk with God. Now here... Paul mentions a person with the gift of giving. He's not talking about someone who tithes, but a person who gives far beyond what is normal. And that is often a person who God has given wisdom and ability to handle finances. Not everyone does well with money. Actually, most people don't. In Proverbs 30, 8 through 9, it says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord, or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Not everyone can handle wealth. And the writer of Proverbs understood this, and so, so he said that. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Now, God has placed most of us in the middle of the road for our own protection. Too much wealth often destroys people. And yet I've known a few godly missionaries, and I still know a couple of them. And these men give a disproportionate amount of their wealth in the service of God. God has given them the gift of giving and often supplies the means with which they can give. Now, in saying that, I also know people who have the gift of giving and who give from their lack and not from their abundance. And... Um, I've been amazed at people who will go without something they want to further the purposes of God. 
But Paul says here, let the person who has the gift of giving be liberal in their giving. Well, then, uh, moving on here. It says, he who leads with diligence. Now, this is the talking of a person who has the gift of, of leadership. In some places, this is called uh, the gift of administration. And this is an interesting gift because it's uh, nothing like it sounds. This person is not necessarily the take charge individual. This person is, is, this is a person who has a gift for handling all the loose ends and details that come with the functioning of a church. This person often has a passion to see other people function in the body as well, but they're often in the background doing all of the things that most of us don't even remember is, are necessary. They also seem to be able to discern other people's gifts and abilities. Now the last gift mentioned here is the gift of, of mercy. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now a person with the gift of mercy always puts people ahead of the program. The person with, who has the gift of teaching or the gift of faith may be so goal-driven that they run over people in their enthusiasm. But the person with the gift of mercies often makes up for them. And I think because mercies is not one of my gifts that I have come to appreciate so much those who have it. The people with this gift are aware of those who are hurting and encourage the rest of us to do something about it. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, it says, But the manifestation of the fruit is given to each one for the profit of all. To the one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, among other gifts listed are five more, which we've not talked about. Wisdom. Now, this, um, this is not talking about, this is not worldly wisdom, but the wisdom that comes from God. And the person who has this gift may not be a teacher or a leader, although they, they could have those gifts also. But a person with this, the gift of wisdom has discernment and is able to give wise counsel to others in the body. Maybe someone who, and I, I've had people like this in, in my life, that if I had something that was really bothering me, I would go and just sit down with that person maybe in, around a cup of coffee and ask them some questions. And in my case, it was, it was always an older person who, who I really, it wasn't, it wasn't a church leader, but it was somebody who just was wise. Knowledge. This is, and this is, not, this is not just any knowledge, but biblical knowledge. And this person has an understanding of spiritual truth and the principles of God's word, and this causes other people in the body to look for them, to them for insight into Scripture. Then faith. The gift of faith is another gift that we don't often think about. I've seen this, this gift in action. I mentioned this last week in regard to when we were building the school in Sulawesi. And the plot of ground appeared to me to be just in a deserted garden spot of some tribal person. And that Harold Bracken, a co-worker, could visualize everything and where it was going to be. And, and you had to remember when we were looking at this property, we had exactly zero dollars to do anything with. But within just a few, very few short years, 
There was a school building and dormitories and teacher's housing. And the gift of faith is the ability to believe God and move ahead in spite of obstacles. And this person doesn't run to the bank to see what they can borrow, but they go to their knees before God. And that's what we've seen happen. In just a very, very short time, all of those, that whole school was there, and there wasn't a single bill that needed to be paid. It was all done. Well, then tongues, the last two gifts mentioned that we haven't looked at are tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Tongues has probably been the most controversial gift in Scripture, and therefore we need to explain it somewhat. Tongues was a sign gift early in church history, and whenever you see the word tongues in the book of Acts, it's referring to known languages at that time. The gift of tongues was the ability to speak in a language without having to learn it. Now, I speak Indonesian, but I had to, to, to do it the hard way. I studied every day for 40 hours a week for 10 months to get a grasp of the language, and I still didn't have a grasp of it. But I could function in it. That's not what happened at Pentecost, where they spoke in known languages that they didn't learn. If you look at Acts 2, 4 through 8, and it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Get that? His own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? So here in Acts, God overcame the curse of Babel, and he did it so that those who knew the gospel could share it. Tongues first made its appearance on the day of Pentecost. Later, this same gift was given to the Gentiles as a sign to the Jews that God had included the Gentiles into the church. And this Pentecost type of experience is never again seen in Scripture after the book of Acts. We do see something different that Paul calls a gift of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 4. It says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him, however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who, speaks, who prophesies edifies the church. Now, Paul listed this type of tongue or ecstatic utterance with the gifts, and it seems from these verses that it was, that he speaks to, he doesn't speak to men, he speaks to God. So it seems that this is a gift used in the prayer life of some. It's important to remember at this time that uh, the writing of Corinthians, that the church was still in its infant stage when tongues were used, when it was the other type of tongues, it was used as a sign to the unsaved. And that's exactly what it says later on in 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. And this is what was happening at Pentecost. Those peoples, did, they didn't believe. And the apostles were speaking in the languages of the nations they were from so that they could understand the gospel. But they were languages. 
And they were assigned to the unsaved. And that being assigned to the unsaved means that there would seldom, if ever, be a situation when it would be appropriate in a meeting of believers. If you look at 1 Corinthians 14, 23, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? So even when the church was in its infancy, tongues were not a regular part of the service. As it says, it was primarily a sign for the unsaved, and Paul cautions against it being used in a meeting of believers. Now, of course, if you... This is what, I'm just, this is what Scripture says. And I bring up tongues for several reasons. You may find... Someone who says that tongues are not for today. And although I have never spoken in tongues myself, I know of men, godly men and women, who do, who do in a prayer life, in their prayer life. And I'm not going to, like I said, I've never done this myself. But if someone says that it's a prayer language to them, I, I will honor them in that. I do think that apparently, because we saw in Corinthians where apparently there's room for that, so I will, I will honor that. You may run into a brother or sister who speaks in tongues and claims that it is an indicator for either salvation or a walk with God. It is neither of those, and there's no scriptural evidence anywhere that shows that this is either an indication of salvation or an indication that someone has a special walk with God. It is not there. If you can show me in Scripture, if you disagree with that and want to show me in Scripture, I will change my position because Scripture is the authority. The subject of tongues has caused division in many churches, but to be honest, tongues is not a serious enough topic to allow it to cause division. The only way it could cause division in this church if someone came in here and says, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. And I would say, I'm sorry, but the Word of God does not say that anywhere. Um, because some do use it as an indicator of a relationship with God, it needs to be addressed. Tongues is the only gift mentioned that is not used for the edification of the church body. And that's why you, you never see it. You, it's, it has no place in a, in a meeting. In 1 Corinthians 14, 6 through 9, it says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. So Paul listed tongues among the spiritual gifts, and it seems like it was later on just something that would be considered a prayer language. He also in mentioned interpretation of tongues. This would be in a situation, let's say that uh, Janet and I had an Indonesian friend that came to this church and wanted to share his testimony and he does not know English he would speak in Indonesian and we would translate which would be interpretation of tongues in the early church that was necessary lots of different languages spoken in, in Indonesian it's necessary I've operated as a translator many times and he, but generally, if you're in a church service, you spoke the language of the people in, that the majority of the church spoke. Well, that brings us now to the last gift, 
which is first in first Corinthians 12, 27 through 28 says, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. And I think when talks about variety of tongues here, it's also referring to people like uh, translators and Bible translators and um, those people who do those, those kind of missionary activities. The helps is uh, the only gift that we've not looked at and people with this gift are easy to identify because they're people who are always where they're most needed. They are ready to take on any task and they do it cheerfully. Now I borrowed this example from the Association of Christian Counselors and this shows how, how gifts operate in a body of believers. Now just imagine that a fabulous turkey dinner has been prepared. Everyone here is participating and each of us have a different gift of the Spirit. Being a, this is our church, there's been a little horseplay going on. And just before the meal is served, someone, well, let's say George, <laughs> accidentally knocks the turkey off the table onto the floor. And to keep this real in your mind, be thinking of different people, I, I shouldn't blame George, but that you know in our church and how they would react. So let's just this think. Now the prophet speaks. I told you to quit fooling around. Now you've wasted all that food. And the gift of help speaks. I'll clean it up. It's okay, I can make another turkey. And then the teacher says, you know there's a lesson in all this. Remember what we talked about in the message two weeks ago and also remember that all things work together for good to them to love God. And then the gift of wisdom chimes in. Everything's fine. Just slice off the area that touched the floor and don't worry about it. <laughs> then the gift of giving adds. Let's forget this and go down to wingers and I'll pay for anyone who can't afford to go. And then the gift of administration advises. Let's get organized. You go get the broom and dustpan. Remember the five second rule. Someone get the turkey picked up and get the undamaged part on a platter. And would one of you men adjust that light so the ladies could see better? <laughs> and then the gift of mercy, speaking to the poor guy who knocked the turkey off, speaking to George, in the first place and says, it's okay. I did the same thing once, probably if we are honest, we have all done something like this, so don't feel bad, it could happen to anyone. And then the evangelist is looking at the one person in the room who is visiting and says, see how we all work together? That's because we are all joint heirs with Christ. If you have a minute, I'd like to explain what that means. The gifts of the Spirit make the different parts of the body function differently in any given situation. And we can see that in our own church body. And we need those differences. In 1 Corinthians 12, 20 through 22, it says, But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Nor can the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Every part of the body of Christ is significant. There are many, many different gifts. And each believer has at least one, and most, I believe, have more than one. And we do, we do need each other. And we are blessed in this body of believers because we... We get along. And, uh, and you know, I, I, know I, I mentioned some things today that were controversial. And I will always go back to this. If you 
If you show me in Scripture anywhere where I'm wrong, I will change what I believe to go along with Scripture. Because I am not the authority. The Word of God is always the authority. If you find that you believe something that is contrary to what the Word of God says, I don't care what your experience has been or what someone you know's experience has been, the Word of God is still the authority. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs>